Yes? Well, wow, I have back at the wall. Room. This is more uh, kind of a bit of feeder, so we are really here to talk, not exactly to give you any magic that will make our ThinkPads work better, but maybe you can help me find out which magic we could make together to improve it. Oh, what can we make to try to improve our laptop experience? Is it a tool? Is it our preferred tool? I mean, I am pretty sure there are people in this room that are closer to their laptops than they are of their special orders, which is not nice, but it's a fact of life. Well, what do we have in the ThinkPad ecosystem as far as we are concerned? Many kernel developers use ThinkPads, so they are often work right out of the box because, I mean, you break it, you have Andrew Morton on your head asking why did you make my laptop stop working, and that's a big advantage for ThinkPad users. Many Debian developers use ThinkPads, as we can see here. And uh, we do have, a, that's pure accident, but we do have an, an advantage. One Debian developer and one Suse developer have direct access to Lenovo. They actually approached us through Suse because they have a working relationship with Suse to sell ThinkPads with Suse inside. And Suse approached me because I am the kernel maintainer of ThinkPad XEPI. And uh, we got some email addresses within Lenovo Japan, which are the people who really make ThinkPads. We cannot use that for uh, a whole deal, but when we have a major emergency or something that re is really obscure, we often contact them. And if you're lucky, they answer that with documentation, or yes, you can do that, here's how you do that. It's not a very open channel, but it is there. S and that channel is about one year old, so it's a new thing. But the reason with this help, we haven't managed to make it perfect yet. I mean, those of you using 2.6.26.2, the newest kernel we have, you should be worried that uh, it's not uh, taking good care of the thermal constraints of your laptop if you are using the next series. Why? It's a simple bug in Linux. Mm -hmm. it's, is it going to be fixed? Yes. Why it happened? Because ACPI is quite complex, so that's not much we can do about it except find out the bugs and fix them. There are three key people right now in the kernel space of things. Me, because I am the unfortunate or fortunate, depending on the day, maintainer of ThinkPad FCPI, which is the kitchen sink driver for ThinkPads. Basically, if it's not something really important like the disk driver system or the ACPI itself, or I don't know, the video drivers or other important subsystems, it belongs on my driver. So I am the one who has to talk to the hotkeys, or until some time ago, the hot swap base, or uh, the internal crazy things of, of a think ThinkPad, like mm -hmm. the built-in mixer for the volume keys, the kitchen sink. Then we have Thomas Henninger from Suze, which is the one who managed to get this contact with Lenovo. He does a lot of uh, kernel work, but really spread so that I don't know exactly what he likes to do more. I have seen works from him and they are all related to ThinkPad mostly on the brightness stuff, also some key issues like hotkeys are not working perfectly on whatever model, please let's see what we can do about that, etc. And Matthew Garrett, which was a Debian developer, I think he's on with Ubuntu now, but I'm not sure. If he's not, I apologize for the misinformation. And he does a lot of kernel work and also I believe he was the main responsible person about moving things from uh, ThinkPad, SCPI to Hall and other layers. And where it leaves us? We have uh, a kernel that, that works mostly well. We have a kernel roadmap, which unfortunately I didn't type it yet, but I can 
talk about it later and you can al actually ask me to change priorities if you want. Um, but we don't have a major task force in Userland, that means Debian or Seuss or Fedora, to actually make these mouse machines work perfectly. I mean, I spent about one week uh, trying to get the hotkey mask right so that it would do the right thing if you get an old ThinkPad like mine or a brand new one from Lenovo. It needs a bit of a different handling on the volume and brightness keys. Okay, so I managed to mostly teach the kernel what to do right. That's fine. Then we have mostly, uh, I think, all Linux distributions overriding that with uh, enable everything mask. And suddenly, oh my, my brightness case don't work. And then I ask, why? And then they say, well, it's like this, this, this. Why do you have those keys enabled? I don't know, because the distro enabled that and that went into how upstream and now it's enabled everywhere. It gets to a point that uh, the people doing the kernel side of things that doesn't exactly know what people are running. So we have a kind of communication problem there. I mean, I can m mostly pay attention to whatever happens in Debian, but to be really, really honest with you, I don't. I have to take care of the problems in the kernel side of things. So my user land configuration is not exactly the default one. And when packages uh, get updated, sometimes it doesn't predict my configuration because it's already customized. So I uh, sometimes I stop what I'm doing and I try to see what's happening and I try to correct that. But unless people, I don't know, file bug reports, I won't be knowing about that. Uh, I think Suze has the same problem, but they have a more tight QA system. So, and Ubuntu, Ubuntu works really well in whatever the Ubuntu developers are using, but the older ThinkPads are in no man's land. In fact, some of them as we have with Brightness keys started there. Well, mostly I would like to know, and I would like to propose you guys to talk to each other and talk to me, and we could, we could share experiences here, what we have found to be best, what's really causing you trouble right now. We can all write it down and see what we could do. Also, if you really want to, we can go down into ThinkPad firmware land. I can explain how this box works. It should be about 90% correct for the newer ones too. And uh, if any of you ha still has an older T model, a T4, I have the firmware here if you want that fixes the annoying fun. So it won't start going <laughs> for no reason at all, just when it needs to. Other than that, well, questions and, and answers time. As I said, it's a bit of feeders, it's not a presentation. So, please. Okay, let's talk about hotkey support. There are two kinds of hotkey firmwares in wide use on ThinkPads, okay? The older one, which is not that old, it means everything be ho be, uh, older than the 60 series. I will type a bit here so it's easier, okay? Since my English is clearly not that good. Uh, so excuse me and please forgive me for using this but it works. Okay. Right? We have two classes of firmware. Old and new. Okay? What's the difference? Lenovo found out that people were getting too confused by those three volume keys. What are those volume keys? In older ThinkPads, which means T4, 
four she's an older and sorry t60 and also a same thing for X and R series, okay? They drive a separate mixer. There is a mixer inside this that's not the normal sound mixer, and they are actually kind of a digital access to a, they didn't want an analog knob that you would roll, so they put this in here. You really shouldn't be trying to do anything else with these keys on these ZK pads. You screw up the dynamic range of the volume control was not designed for any sort of, I press here and I increase or decrease the volume of the AC97 mixer. It was not designed to do that. But people found out that they could do that. So far so good. That's why the driver lets you do that. And some people started using that. So far so good as well. It's your problem. And then they placed that on distros and that's not so good. What happens is that in Windows, you have uh, some sort of on-screen display that's always there. And we do not have that on Linux. We do not have a proper on-screen display interface. We don't. Uh, and actually, my driver also has part of default because I do not export yet an AUSA mixer to access this mixer. So people hook it on active events, things that are supposed to command the ThinkPad to do something to use it for on-screen display, and then they do, did even worse. They hooked into um, event uh, input events that actually order your uh, GNOME mixer or so to lower and higher the, the AC97 volume, and that made complete mess. And there are the new machines. The new machines have a hardware mute button. I don't know if it's harder or firmware because I haven't debugged their BIOS yet, but they do muting in hardware, and the volume keys are just that, keys. Lenovo made me a big favor, and they send the volume, key volume up and key volume down directly through the keyboard controller, okay? So what happens in a machine like that is that if you didn't do anything weird to think pay that CPI, it never gets the the events it uses it to because they come up as keys, as normal keys, and then whatever listens to normal keys will get them and process them to highs or lower the volume. That's what should be happening. However, due to configuration issues and also because people always go there and mess with the, the hotkey mask, that's not what you're seeing. And we have something weird going on on the kernel side of things. In the interface that talks from the kernel to the embedded controller, which is actually the keyboard controller also in the, in the ThinkPad. And that's causing some weird problems, including weird response from hotkeys and sometimes uh, event loss. So I am not actually quite sure exactly why your keys stop working. What I can tell is that uh, if you read the documentation for ThinkPad SAPI, you see that uh, you have some bits on the key hotkey mask that are for volume. You leave those off. That's the default. And if you have a new machine, it should just work because you get the events from the keyboard. Then it's just a problem of getting x, x.org, to actually know what those mean and map them to whatever x uh, key keyboard event it needs to so that gets to GNOME mixer and raises or lowers the volume, or can carry the edge, same thing. So is it complicated? Yes, it's a lot more complicated than it should be. It should just work off out of the box. The kernel size is prepared to work outside of the box, but I something in the New Zealand is not. When you, in another model, when you press any of the hotkeys, the volume hotkeys, any of them, it does two things. Actually, it does three things. First, the firmware or the hardware, I don't know exactly which, actually rises or lowers the volume controller that takes care of your headphone output and built-in speakers. It does not affect the line out which you can get on the docks, okay? 
it does another thing. It, up, it updates the CMOS non-volatile RAM so that if you reboot or shut down, you get the same volume again. And the third thing does it sends an ACPI event that I can mask or not. That's what the hotkey mask does. And ThinkPad the CPI actually only echoes that back. It tells the kernel, oh, that's a valid CPI event. Please echo that to user space and does nothing else. So it actually like a you could hook on those events to use them as on-screen display, but you are not supposed to hook on them to do anything else. Uh, somebody did, I think, I don't, I'm not sure it has been undone, but for a while, how was programmed to hook on these events and generate the active, uh, please raise volume, please lower volume events, and that was causing a lot of trouble. But on the other hand, people would see the beautiful on-screen display and think, oh, now it works. It worked before. But you didn't ha get the, the feedback that you needed to know it works. That's why people in Linux are confused by the volumes, the, the volume keys on the old style of ThinkPads, but people in Windows never were because they had that feedback, so they did understand that, oh, look, that volume slider is not changing, but it told me that volume slower and higher, and I can hear that in my speakers, so it's working. And they were fine with that. Lenovo noticed that problem, and then they changed it so that you now have a new type of just keys. Easier for us to, uh, to deal with that as well, I suppose, but now you cannot uh, lower or high the vo your volume in BIOS or in DOS or something else. So it's not important anymore, I, I think. I just have one more question about that. Does that mean that there's no way to simulate that, that first action that it takes, which is modifying the, the internal <coughs> volume thing? Well, very, very old ThinkPads do not issue ACPI events for volume keys. But I can get them by pulling the CMOS in VRAM. No, I mean and I could do that on new ones as well. I mean the opposite. Um, I mean, is it possible to have a user space program that modifies that doesn't change any ALSA settings, but does modify the hardware volume. The f I'm not understanding you correctly, I think, but... No, uh, let me, you talked about three things of pushing the yes. button Yes, you cannot block the actions of the BIOS so that doesn't change the hardware. But what I'm asking is, can you... Set them? Yes. Simulate the... Can you actually modify the BIOS volume values in user space? Yes, you can. Uh, but there's no such a thing on a new ThinkPad. They took yeah. away the, 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 the mixer. You only have now a mute gate, which I am unfortunate. I just don't know how to program that mute gate. Um, we could find that out. Someone uh, sits alongside with me for a while with a new thing. Or we could ask directly Lenovo about that. But I do know that they, they made something like that. You press mute it mutes. You press mute again, it remains mute. If you press any of the volume up or down keys, they, it unmutes and sh swallows the, the key press. And the next key press gets through the keyboard controller as if you... So they tried to emulate the old ThinkPad behavior in firmware. As I said, it really should work. If it's not working transparently, that means we either are not doing something in user space that we should be doing, to when we get a, a, a volume up and down from the keyboard controller. Uh, or we are getting confused. I mean, ThinkPad SAP never sees those key presses, so I'm pretty sure the kernel is not, on this instance, doing something bad. Brightness is not something else. The brightness control is wrong in the kernel side. It's not user space. Uh, anything else you would like to talk about, the volume keys? Thank you. Okay, so I like very much the old behavior of having two different mixers. Yes. And I have an X60 and I have also a T42P. And if I understand co correctly, this old behavior is going to be changed? To the it has one? been changed. Okay. Is, it, is there a way to have, uh, to have back the old behavior? Yes. Okay. But what like what I'm going to tell you. <laughs> you will have to reverse engineer the EC firmware Okay, and the embedded controller on a ThinkPad does a lot of stuff. 
it has two I2C buses that talk to the batteries. The batteries are normal uh, smart battery systems batteries, so you have the full documentation of all the protocol that goes to the batteries. It also emulates the keyboard controller and it takes care of a lot of other stuff such as AGAPS, the accelerometers. Uh, the source code for the T4X series and also R5X series and a part of the X series, well, somebody did that to work. You could try to get that, co that work and improve on it and get that from new, get your BIOS and do the same. And then you would be able to, to get the older behavior. However, I'm almost sure that um, about half of what a ThinkPad does is in the BIOS running on a uh, system management mode. I mean, uh, as far as I know, the embedded controller doesn't even generate a CPE interrupt. So something is doing that. And if it's not doing it by itself, it means the BIOS is doing that. As far as I know, it generates SMM and traps only. I mean, it's probably too much work, not worth it. Unfortunately, but be my guest. Mm? Okay, and you could also uh, have a driver in kernel that uh, trapped these keys on a very low level and emulated in kernel the old behavior you liked so much so that nothing else can uh, mess with it. That's doable and not even very difficult. I mean, we have input handlers in the kernel. You can do that. If and I would accept a patch for that from think by the CP as well, so it's not a problem. Uh, anything else about OMP? Sure. sure. It's not anymore about the keys, but it's something that I found um, one month ago. So I have an X60 and I have documentation, and I was quite surprised that uh, my documentation didn't work out of the box. Dock and stations are... Uh, no, wait, 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 because then I, I tried a long time ago, because the only way to use the CD-ROM is the <coughs> X60 as a dock station. I tried a long time ago, ago I tried to debug, and uh, it seems that all the information on the wiki, wiki was correct, and I didn't succeed. And then uh, three, three weeks ago, I found that uh, the Debian kernel has a patch, which disabled the AHCE, -E whatever, in the control. I'm sorry, I didn't get the first yeah, part. The lib beta, the, the, um, the SD, the docking station cannot use the lib beta bus or processor system because the Debian kernel has a patch that disables the recognition of the PCI controller for the lib beta. Okay, let's talk about dock stations and that you said. Um, docking in the kernel was not exactly in good shape until about there about uh, 2, 6, 24 and thereabouts. It really was not in good shape, okay? It's not nothi nothing magical, but nobody had worked on that for a long time and it didn't do the right things always. So we had some sort of uh, helpers, I think paid SEPI and other drivers, and those did work most of the time. Uh, for think paid SEPI, you could ask it to handle the dock and the bay and to generate uh, ACPI events that are private to the driver. It's not a real generic event. It was IBM and a lot of numbers. And you could hook on that to order the system to eject, which means power off the bay, and also to amount, uh, amount and do other housekeeping you wanted before you eject on something. The problem is with that, that unfortunately, think by the CPI, uses a really weird way to find out which ACPI node needs to do something. And that really holds things on the T60 and later because they started using SATA, serial ATA base, and they still had the parallel ATA base and so suddenly they had two nodes. And uh, I would have to teach the driver to know which node should use to request an eject or something like that. I never got to this point. Why? Because the, the roadmap was to teach the kernel itself how to do docking and undocking in a generic way, not a ThinkPad way or anything like that. 
uh, that means that you need a patch to ThinkPad SCPI to get it to work on certain ThinkPads, and that patch break other ThinkPads. Depends on which ThinkPad you're using. Uh, then somebody started working on a generic dock and a generic bay drivers. Those do work, but they were, uh, they were about uh, halfway done by 2624, and 2625 is much better, and I believe 2626 actually does what it's supposed to. And somebody talked, uh, LibAta, the, the hard drive subsystem, about uh, ACPI commands that needs to send to the disks, and that causes conflicts, and so I'm not pretty sure they have fixed that or not, but Libiata would say, oh, this hard drive has ACPI commands to send, and it would grab the handle, and then Doc would come and, oh, somebody's already using it. Bay would come, and, oh, somebody's already using it, and you can have only one driver per ACPI node, and things wouldn't work. I believe this has been fixed, it m but may be that it has not gone to mainline Linux yet. I have seen patches, but I was not tracking them. And if you ask, oh, and what are you using? I'm using the old ThinkPad way on my, my computer because that way I still know whether that my driver is working right or not, so it's a debugging effort for me. If you want it to work on a T60, I can send you the patch. But I did not look on the Debian kernel which kind of patches they have. I can look at it now. That's a big problem with ThinkPage ICPI. It, when it starts, it looks for every uh, available device in the CPI tables, and it inserts supports for those. If you are not docked when you start, it doesn't notice that. It's a known problem, it's a bug. I have never fixed it because, uh, as I said, the roadmap was to switch to the dock and bay drivers that are generic and do not have this problem. I believe they even know how to swap the batteries nowadays. I have seen patches. So um, it's a no problem. If it really is annoying people, will please drop me a note by email and I can see what I can do about that. But then we, well. It's a patch to think by the CPI or something else? Then I'm a bit stumped, sorry, because I really don't know exactly what's broken. I would have to look at the patch. Okay. But it is supposed to, with a very new kernel, to just work out of the box and dock and then dock cleanly. In fact, I suppose, uh, I think it even amounts things. Not in a nice way to scream blood murder that you are removing a device that still has file system on it and say something about that uh, 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 self-destructing five seconds or something like that, uh, but it will unlock. If you hook to the, uh, to the ACPI notifications, which will not be on over ACPI itself, it will be over uh, U-Events, because Doc and Bay is U-Events, so it means you dev if you can uh, script on new dev, you can do the unmounting. I think they have that on ThinkWeek, but I haven't checked. I can look at that. Okay, so that's one thing to look at. Um, anything else about that? Yeah, another uh, topic change. Yeah, that worked now. Uh, there is supposed to be a working computer model in all ThinkPads. How is it support? What it supposed to be capable of doing? In how it usable now? Can we do uh, hardware key storage already? What user land and kernel uh, support we already have for that model? 
I'm sorry, I didn't get it perfectly. Please uh, oh, okay. do. Uh, we have a trust in computer module in all three parts. Uh, modem. Module. Module? Yeah. Oh, yes, okay, yeah. let's talk about the TPM. I have actually tried to use the thing, okay, so I can talk about, about it. You have, again, old and new ThinkPads. So what do you get? With the older ones, like the uh, T43, you have uh, 1.1B TPM module. With the newer ones, you have a 1.2 TPM model, and they are very different beasts, okay? For once, somebody was intelligent for once, and the 1.2 TPM model has a generic interface that works on every model from every manufacturer. That was not true for the 1.1b. Uh, the BIOS can use it. It sets it up correctly. So in fact, you actually have a platform that could use to do code att attestation they call that. Uh, it has a private key you can try to use for seeing things. But something's a bit wrong with the user space support, at least for, uh, for the TPM on my computer, which has uh, national semiconductor one, and it doesn't get the, the public key correct. I don't know why. If you, uh, if you request the information uh, from the kernel, it outputs the correct one, but the um, the TPM tools doesn't, it groups the data somewhere, so obviously it doesn't work. What it should be able to do? When you boot the ThinkPad, if you haven't disabled the TPM on BIOS, it will generate checksums, and it will store those checksums on registers. Uh, th those, um, there's a table on ThinkWeek, I think I put it there, and there's a table on the specifications that tells you what goes there, but you basically you can have registers that tell you if the supervisor password was typed and which one, or user password and which one, the hardware configuration such as what was the boot device, if there is a, a something like a CD-ROM in the bay or not. It, any, f any change on any of those things change those checksums, and invalidate keys that are bound to those checksums. If you can get that uh, user, user space program to actually talk correctly to your TPM, it will work. But that's not much more to be said about the TPM. It's a closed source hardware. It's a closed documented, documented hardware. You, you don't even get, uh, there's a, a small password on this thing that lets you get uh, and change the private key or ask it to regenerate the private key. You don't even have that, at least not on 1.1b on one dot, dot one TPMs. So it's not really safe to use. I mean, you can't even trust it to do what it's supposed to do correctly. And I should tell you that although I do not have access to it, I am pretty sure that one of those uh, utilities you can get from people in .ru to reset the BIOS passwords it actually does that by writing to the TPM non volatile run. If you can do that, I th I'm sorry, I can't trust that chip for anything. There was supposed to be also a secure memory within that stuff. Yes, that's exactly the memory. That's you can memory? write okay. from a DOS utility to hack the password in a stolen machine. I mean, okay, nice. Thank you. Probably our keys are safe, but I don't think the data inside that TPM is really safe. The new ones work, okay, but again, they are they have the same problem. How much can you trust that? I don't know. I wouldn't use it for much. It's better to get a smart card with your open <coughs> GPG keys inside and use that. It's safer. Any more questions, ideas? So have you had a chance to work with some of the new, some of the brand new ThinkPads coming out, the X300, X200? How well are they going to work? Well, nobody uh, asked me yet for support for the X300 beautiful think, uh, blue LED on the ThinkLight button or something like that. But mostly they should just work. 
uh, Lenovo is not trying to do weird things on those models. And they did add some new interfaces such as uh, a toggle so that you can enable and disable the wireless USB device. And but they did that in a way that if I look at the ACPI tables, I figure right, out, right away how I should use that. They just copied the Bluetooth and changed names, something obvious. And they actually sent me some documentation about that when I asked about Bluetooth, so I, I should be able to write code for that. Uh, I'm not aware of any changes to those ThinkPads that should cause us trouble. So I would actually get one for myself. Oh yeah, something that has been brought to our attention pr uh, pretty recently. The newer ThinkPads, mostly the X series, they use uh, some kind of active cooling. So if you have one with a very powerful processor, be aware that the phone cannot cool it enough. So what the BIOS does is that it, it requests the, the operating system to lower the, the maximum speed. And uh, if it doesn't do that, it will over go over temperature and you shut down and you lose your work. That's a problem with the 2662. Two two. I mean, the latest table has this problem. The patch is already out. Should be on. Okay. But that's something to keep in mind. I mean, you got a pro um, uh, expensive th laptop, which has uh, 2 gigahertz CPU, and it will want to run it at 1 gigahertz most of the time because of the temperature. It's not nice. What people do is open the thing and improve the thermal on the thermal center. It's not difficult to do because Lenovo is not doing a top of the line head sinking. So you just remove the, the thermal compound, put something much better that overclocks like to use, and you get about five or six Celsius degrees out of it. So maybe it's enough to run at top, at top speed. Other ThinkPads have uh, issues with uh, that uh, thermal sink become loose and detaching from the ship, so you don't have a perfect thermal interface anymore and starts with heating up. So if, if your ThinkPad starts getting warm, please do pay attention and fix it as, as soon as possible, otherwise it can get damaged. Anything else? Do you want to talk about, want to know about some of the firmware inside the box? Something about the the hardware, anything? No? Just use it? It's not completely related, but can I make a poll? How many of the, the, the think ThinkPad user which, uh, with the fingerprint reader use the fingerprint actually? I'm sorry, I uh, didn't get Yes, that. how many? I am the fingerprint. Uh, one of the oh fingerprint the maintainers. Okay. So I just want to know how many ThinkPad users uh, with the fingerprint on it use this fingerprint on the system. Well, I don't have a fingerprint reader, so I'm I not. Yes, yes, definitely. Yes. What I have heard from other users Sorry. is that it just works. We have 10 minutes left. Well, I've heard that it's not that safe, but I have looked into it and they use the one of the best technologies about that, so you can't, easily, you can't, I mean, duplicate very easily a, a finger and pass that and it will give you a first reading. It's not that easy. 
but it appears that uh, it generates a small number, a small signature, and that's a problem because you can try to brute force that. So it should be pretty safe for your screensaver or something like that. Yeah. I would use it. I would like to say something about if this are like hardware-wise and implementation-wise, it's uh, reasonably safe. I have a little problem with it uh, not being configured in a safe way because the problem is that uh, it's now integrated with PAM and some stuff supported, some stuff not. One of the things that supported is, for example, SSH login. So if someone's about, you can see, oh, he's about to um, enter his uh, GDM whatever username and about to swipe his finger, I can log in to SSH to his machine with his username, he swipes the finger, it for some reason doesn't work for him, I hit enter, it enters. So there should be some way to blacklist remote services on the PAM login. In fact, there is a problem with the leap PAM. Uh, the original designer of the Fprint, which is the project that currently uh, involves more fingerprint readers in, and any of the ThinkPads readers, uh, said that she, um, he designed it just as a proof of concept. So it's not that safe. Uh, it has a lot of problems uh, with, uh, for example, if you have a screen locker and you don't uh, well, l let's say that screen lockers and GDM and KDM don't behave as, as the same. Some of them you have to press enter to continue. For example, GDM does not, but KDM does. Uh, some, some services uh, doesn't behave the exactly the same. So it's more like a lip pump uh, problem that lip pump, pro uh, lip pump problem that the F print design. Is not exactly the most safe and easy design we have. That's the hard truth. So, basically, just a, a bit of background. There are two implementations one which is ThinkAbout specific and it's called ThinkFinger, and it was uh, started by Pavel Matek, one of the kernel, kernel developers, together with Timo Onik from uh, SUSE. And uh, so it got released 0 0.3 and it died. I mean, it died <laughs> in the sense. <laughs> And uh, in the sense that uh, it was just probably just a quick act to show that this fingerprint can, can work on Linux. And this has the same problem that on, pa on uh, SSH actually. So you could not anymore log in on SSH if you enable fingerprint authentication remotely, which was quite annoying. And then there was the new software, which is Fprint, which is available in Debian as well, is an experimental, as fingerprint, think finger, which is an experimental tool. And this is, as Derek said, this is not only specific to ThinkPad. It's for all kind of, uh, it's something like a, a general library for fingerprint authentication. And it's not not anymore in early stage, but because it's actually they change, they change the uh, API two or three times, but it works now. They need the, uh, an involvement, uh, there's some progress in LibUSB, because there was problem with the old LibUSB, LibUSB, but it's still, still not, uh, I mean, not everyday authentication avail uh, is ready, actually. But it's not just ready to uh, remote authentication without some terrible PAM well the magic and specify. Yeah. And the problem with PAM is that I tested most of the screen server available on Linux with ThinkFinger and, and Fprint, and they behave all differently. They behave really all different. So for example, normally Xing Saver needs to ask a fingerprint, it's locked, works sometimes, sometimes other does lo doesn't work. Sometimes it's so slow that you think it's not working after the fingerprint and actually it's working, but you need to wait two or three minutes. For example, VLOG works, I use VLOG, so VLOG works, uh, login works, uh, K all, all which is KDE related, I, I didn't test a lot. So it's still, it's still, uh, there's still roads to go. So 
I, I, that's an, probably the main reason, and I'm, I'm sure that's the main reason we didn't put it in a table. It's still an experiment. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, tests are worth on, on such as well. Yeah, I'm just. Just to add uh, a comment, uh, j uh, fingerprint is just another security measure. Don't rely 100% uh, of it. But this project, uh, a print, is going to make a huge, uh, um, not I don't I won't say improvement. Uh, I think um, it's going to add uh, a lot of more features. And if you are developers, and most of us are. Uh, please take it into account. Uh, take a look to to a print mailing list. Uh, <coughs> we, with Luca and Seraco, the one who is at the at the corner, uh, work in Debian integration of uh, biometrical gadgets. Um, we will be pretty happy if you join us with feedback. Uh, so that's all. Well, we have five minutes left. Uh, I would like to propose a small, small vote. What would you guys want me to do to put in the priority queue for three page CPI? What's missing? Uh, my current queue has also mixer to control the, the older mixer, which is not going to have much with the new thing pads. Maybe I will be able to have a single mute and a mute control on your ThinkPad, but that would be it. On the other ones, you have a full mono mixer. The second is to better integrate uh, with the, the hardware monitoring. It's already good, but I could do a bit better. I could have a fan controller inside the kernel, or something like that. The third would be to have better environmental control. As I said, it's a kitchen sink driver, so it's the place where I would put some kind of thermal sentinel and start uh, issuing kernel emergency messages because it's too hot or something. But that's something you could do in other spaces as well if you want. Uh, and also, I have a pending request to add support for RFQ, which I'm working currently working on for ultra wideband USB and also a uh, wide area networking on uh, WiMAX or something like that that some new thing pads have. But do you want to have any requests? Do you have any? Uh, I would like to clone your tree <laughs> so I can help in your in the other mixer. Okay, my tree is available at Git dot, uh, let's see, it's easier to show you, I think. However, it's a patch top queue, so it's not exactly something you can clone and then merge and something like that. It will always show you the latest state of the driver and something you can work on it here. It's repo.r.cz, the full URL is here. Oh, there they are. This one. You have many branches here, okay? So, but there are only two of interest for people who want to work with it, which are Devil and Master. Okay, Master is something that I use to keep uh, data like uh, to-do lists and all patches that have been accepted on my mind. The value is the top of the my working branch. Anything that is actually good enough that won't cause major issues ends up here. And as you can see, lots of it's RFQ work because I started doing that so that I could plug it into ThinkPlayer CPI and I had to do a lot of working on that part of the kernel and I haven't finished it yet, so I am doing both. But you just clone that, and I, I will accept patches and anything like that. Unfortunately, you can't have a, a Git workflow with me because uh, I'm not prepared to have trees that are not hand-wound yet. I might do that if m too many people start talking, 
and I become suddenly have to act as a subsystem maintainer, I will do that. But right now it's a patch queue, and patch queues get rewound all the time in Git, so you can't just merge. It's an, it's an issue, but so far nobody has really complained. I wanted to ask about uh, how the state is with power management and the wake-ups I think that ACFI was producing. Sorry, can you repeat um, that? Power management of our yeah, time is up. Okay. Some kernels ago, uh, when I last tested it, the syncpad ACPI module was generating a lot of wake-ups. Well, here's what you we've got right now, okay? Wait a bit. As you can see, almost nothing comes from Syncpad ACPI. It generates about no interrupts, unless you actually get any, any some sort of notification from your Syncpad, or if you enable its NVRAM pooling mode, at which time it will generate 10 interrupts per second. Okay, uh, maybe if you want. You can actually tell it to generate less or more, but 10 is a good number. What we did see was that something was bothering ThinkPay, the CPI, through its proc interface and requesting data all the time. So uh, if I do this, I'm using the sensors here, but it would be that is a small request for temperatures took about, I don't know, 100 to 200 EC cycles, and that's that's slow. That causes a lot of wake ups. So someone someone was doing a lot of polling for thermal data or something like that, and that caused all those interrupts you have seen. It has been fixed, not by me. Someone was using it, and they, oh god, I'm doing something wrong, and fixed that, and I've had no reports since then. Is there anything that is still missing? from uh, the power saving side compared to, for example, Windows? Yes, lots. But the, the main one is a proper one screen display control so that we have less confused users. Okay, our time is up. We have to go.